<laughs> Ready, set, go. Welcome everybody to the San Diego Tribune Festival of Books. Actually, can I take that again? <laughs> Just kidding. We're gonna do it one more time and she'll edit it out. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the San Diego Union Tribune Festival of Books. My name is Melissa Vanales. I'm the author of the coming of age Lambda Literary Finalist novel, Life is Wonderful, People are Terrific. I will be your host today as we have with us two excellent authors in the genre of young adult romance. Let me say that again. Our panel today is young adult romance. With us today is Sarah Kuhn. She is the author of From Little Tokyo with Love, absolutely outstanding, and the equally outstanding Katie Haney, author of Girl Crushed. We're going to be talking about these books today as well as speaking with these fantastic writers. Sarah, I believe you're joining us from Los Angeles, That's and great. Katie, I believe you're joining us from New York, so thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to just open with a really, it's kind of general, kind of not, <laughs> question, only because I believe young adult romance is always so difficult to explain. <laughs> but really what I like to think of it is coming of age. And both of these books in their complexity and their stylizing just normalize self-identity. And to me, that's like its own romance. They're so rich in identity and yet they're relatable. I kept thinking of a diversity of readers that I would recommend these to. And so what I wanna ask both of you is, what aspects of coming of age do you think you highlight or even try to transform? And we can start with Sarah. If you sure. <laughs> it's always good to call on someone in a virtual panel because everyone is so polite. We just don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, for me, one of the things I really love about writing uh, both coming of age and romance and, and combining them is just um, that you get to go so deep into character mm -hmm. and perhaps so <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately maybe relive some important moments from your from your youth. Um, but I think for me, especially with this book, you know, it's about a girl who uh, does not believe in happily ever, ever after. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is like me, a mixed race biracial Japanese American person and as uh, she has grown up in a community where she is a little bit of an outcast you know she uh, not not simply because she is biracial but because she is also a tragic orphan there are things you know, in her past that, that people sort of look at and judge um, but I think for me um, I always love uh, writing the idea that um, when you find yourself and you're sort of able to express that in the most truthful way, it is such a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, in this book, I was writing that for, you know, several of the characters, but mostly for Rika, who's the main character we just described, very grouchy. And she has a hard time kind of relating to a lot of people. And I was kind of writing something um, that had, had partially mirrored my experience where there were times where it in this sort of um, greater Asian American community, which has been just so important to me in every aspect of my life, where I felt like, you know, maybe I would not belong, or maybe I was not Asian enough, or I would be a little left out, or, you know, things like that. And sort of this great revelation to me when I found kind of my greater Asian American creative arts community here in LA was that literally everybody in the community told me they had felt like that at some point, you know, for whatever reason, for being too something or not enough of something else, or for perhaps having different intersecting identities that they saw as, um, you know, something that, would, that wouldn't allow them to be accepted or wouldn't allow them to belong or whatever it was. And um, I, 
I thought that was really interesting. And it was it's a way that I think um, our community has also been able to, to come together more in, in discussing the sort of diversity that exists within that massive diaspora umbrella. Um, so that was something that um, I really wanted to home in on because I, I think for me, the idea that sort of, especially when you're a teenager, letting letting current teenagers know that everybody at some point has a feeling that they do not belong, has a feeling that they're left out, has a feeling that there's no place for them. Um, and there is always a place for them. There are always places where you belong. Sometimes it's maybe just a little bit harder to find them or you have to find the right people to connect to or you have to realize that everybody feels that way at some point and it's not just you. Um, so that's kind of an area of that sort of coming of age idea and finding your identity and sort of learning how to express it in all of its nuance and celebrate it. That is always very beautiful to me. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. I think that's very true. We're all an outcast. <laughs> Katie, I, I would love to hear what aspects of coming of age you think your book highlights or tries to transform? Yeah, so I, I wanted to write, I mean, the main thing I felt when I set out to write this was that I wanted to write a young gay protagonist who was already out when the book began and did not have a crisis about it because, um, you know, most of the books that I have read, um, or at least that I read when I was a teenager, um, if there was a coming out story, it was sort of the central conflict of the book. Um, and that's still true of a lot of uh, queer characters in young adult books today. And so I want, this was based in part on my wife's experience. She came out when she was 14 and, um, you know, it was difficult, especially in 2002, but um, she was also very well liked, very, you know, athletic, did not have a lot of trauma tied to being gay. And I just wanted that to sort of be incidental to her character. It's an important part of who she is, but it's also um, established when the book comes out. So I wanted her to be able to just have sort of a normal love triangle like any other kid would be able to have. And Quinn does. <laughs> yes. And it's so lovely. It's Thank you. Really We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that <laughs> triangle. <laughs> I tell you, we are going to get to that triangle. I feel I feel like this is, and thank you both for speaking to this, because I, I saw similar themes in both these books, too. And one of them was loneliness. But it's like you both say, like, it's not the devastation of loneliness. It's, oh, I'm lonely, or like, someone left me, like in Katie's book or in Sarah's book. I don't have a mom. Like, what's going on? Like, who am I? And and instead, both characters are inspired to seek out who they are, you know, see what happens. Sarah, I, I love how your book flips YA romance on its head because, like, you know, YA romance, the romance is still supposed to be this romance, but for Rika, it's the romance of her identity, her history. <laughs> That's the romance. And she does romanticize it. I think all young people do. You know, or who would our mom be? Who would I be? So, you know, in fact, Hank doesn't even enter the picture until Rika's like, I need a friend to help me on this journey. You look like you're up for it. Like, so the question to you is this, what was it like writing a YA romance that was in ways going against the romance formula? Um, well, I guess I feel like it doesn't go against her. Uh -huh. uh -huh. um, Tell me, I, I think. That, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I think that that's a bit of a disservice to romance, mm. to both YA and adult romance, because I don't think that a lot of people realize that romance encompasses so much. You know, there is there is so much within romance that is so beautiful and is so different is it is so diverse. And a lot I mean, you know, in any romance the characters do have other things going on in their life. A lot of times the the romantic uh, story or the conflict might be a bit central, but you know, they usually like I, I think that one of the reasons I find romance so beautiful it is is it is such a character driven genre. You know, you have to go so deep into the the minds and the emotions of the, the protagonist or protagonist and you kind of have to really show what they are feeling so deeply at every turn of the story which I think is extremely hard to do. Um, you see that in a lot of 
you know, perhaps, um, you know, like a lot of big block blockbuster movies, there's sort of this talk about like, oh, the movie was great, but the romance wasn't very good. And I'm always like, yeah, that's the hardest part to do. It's the part that people disrespect the most and sort of treat like it's the least important. But it is actually one of the hardest things to do to write that so believably because you have to go so deep into the characters. Mm -hmm. So I guess I felt like, you know, with this, um, it is a, a romance that is perhaps more focused on one protagonist on mm -hmm. this girl, Rika. We don't go as deep into the mind of Hank Chen, who is her, her <laughs> love interest, her cute yeah. sort of sensitive dancing boy, uh, yeah. cute actor love interest. Um, but we do get some of his arc, you know, we see sort of him through her. And um, so I, I, I think, um, you know, when I, when I thought of this, thought about this book, I, I kind of always start there. I always start with like, there's this girl and then it's this and that, and here's what she's dealing with. But I think as far as um, getting into the romance of her identity, you know, I, I love that that's kind of a thing, that that's something you sort of picked up on. Because I think for me, a lot of this book was actually learning how to celebrate my own identity and kind of, again, all of its nuance and all of the different, the different shades that it it comes in. And I really credit um, my editor, Jenny Bach, who's the first Asian American woman editor I have been lucky enough to work with. And she really pushed me on that. You know, she was like, there is something here that is very real and is very authentic. And if you feel comfortable with that, I want you to kind of go deeper into it and really talk about the, the reality of this, of how it's affected you, of how you sort of existing in these different communities where you feel like sometimes you don't belong, how that kind of affects you, because that is something that, again, I, affects everyone, whether we, we realize that or not. Um, yeah. so a lot of that was just me trying to go deeper into that, me trying to sort of um, learn how to celebrate it. And I think also, like, I really, you know, love what Katie was saying about, you um, the sort of idea of, of tragedy or of things being sad or whatever, because of course that's something that we talk about a lot when we're um, writing characters who are like ourselves who are of marginalized identities. Um, there has been this kind of focus on what is the tragedy? How is it sad? Can you talk about how much you've suffered? Can you please put that the essay format? <laughs> yeah. in book? And, you know, my whole thing has always been like, we aren't sad all the time. Like it's not, mm -hmm. you know, we aren't, and we aren't sort of here to just demonstrate that for you to sort of demonstrate how racism is bad or how homophobia is bad or whatever it is. Like, we are not just here for that. We have our own stories to tell. And so I kind of wanted to get into the idea that like, she sort of sees, Rika sort of sees herself as tragic because so many other people do because she hasn't really give, been given this alternate narrative, you know, in a lot of sort of fairy tales and mythology, if there is a character of color or especially a mixed race or biracial character, there's sort of this idea that they are just there to be sad. They're there to be tragic. They're there to, to illuminate someone else's story. And so, you know, I kind of wanted to convey the idea that the re one of the reasons she sees herself as this tragic orphan is that is the narrative people have imposed upon her. They do not understand how she how she could be happy. And mm -hmm. I feel like I've, I've experienced that in my own life as well. People always seem to think I'm torn between two worlds and everything is mm -hmm. terrible. And I can, you know, I can never experience like a moment of happiness because I'm so busy being a, a tragic uh, biracial person. <laughs> and um, that's just not, that's it's just tragic. not true. So um, <laughs> like, like Katie was saying about her book, you know, being more of maybe a celebration or just like mm -hmm. having that as as more of a happy focus i did kind of want to show like you know there is this idea and obviously there are struggles within any experience but there is a space for us to be happy there's a space for us to celebrate our own identity so i guess like while i was writing this maybe i was having my own love affair with you know my my identity <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I really, and I'm excited to hear that it was a love affair for you. I feel as, you know, we write these books and it's a lot of work for us and we put a lot into it. So it's good to hear that. I, and I, and I, and Katie, it's, I feel like, again, you, it's similar. Like your book falls in line with so many things that are young adult romance. And then at the same time, 
It doesn't. I mean, there's this mm-hmm. rich first person narrator, Quinn. There's this vivid high school timeline. I felt like I was in the truck and I was getting drunk. <laughs> I just, I totally, and like you said, like it's not a tragic, I'm coming out, my life's over, I get dumped. It's like, right. not dumped. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Before senior year and this feeling of just, a thoughtful underdog. That's what I like. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like this thoughtful underdog who who knows like I'm down and out, but what does that mean? <laughs> and I appreciate that. And I I feel that that's also something we don't see is just like you said, that normalcy of heartbreak. Mm-hmm. And I my question for you is how was it for you to write a love story that isn't steeped in so much trauma? Right. Um, did it feel normalized? Were you like, huh, maybe this doesn't sound real? Like, I mean, because the truth is, I'm also a queer writer and I wrote a coming of age story and I did what you said. I was like, it was hard, but now I want to party. It was like, mm-hmm. I had to like mention it was hard because I felt almost like I was doing this disservice to be right. queer and being, you know, if I didn't like get real and go, yeah, well, it, it was hard. But tell mm-hmm. me, you, like you said, you didn't want to write that book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's still elements that are hard for her that um, wouldn't show up necessarily in a book about a straight protagonist. I mean, when she is dumped and she thinks, and as far as she knows, her ex is the only other queer girl in the high school. That sort of uh, really limits her options. Um and, and she still lives in a world where people are presumed straight and she makes that mistake herself because she was also raised in a heteronormative society. So even though she's gay, like it's still, you still have to sort of fight that default assumption. Um, and that comes up with Ruby. And so, um, I, you know, there are elements that, that feel maybe especially lonely because she's gay, but she doesn't really think about it that way. I think she just feels like I'm dumped and this sucks. And this person was also my best friend and now I don't know how to be around her. Um, and, um, yeah, kind of being torn between that person that she's loved in the past and this new interesting person who she doesn't know as well, but is, is very intriguing to her. That's, I love how you say it's very intriguing to her because that's <laughs> like exactly how it, it feels. It doesn't mm-hmm. feel any other way. It feels like I'm intrigued. And again, both these characters are so inspired to go towards mm-hmm. that. Um, right. Sarah, you said something really great that I thought we could both talk about too. Uh, well, you both of you to talk about is you mentioned, oh, like I didn't know I was this way or this character, Rika doesn't know there that she is this way until this narrative of, of, of your tragic story gets put on her. Um, what, do you, what do you both feel is being put on your characters that maybe was even kind of out of your own control? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think it's just, you know, what, what you were kind of talking about before. It's just a lot of sort of misconceptions about what that experience is, you know, I think, um, especially when you are writing characters that are, you know, like you or share your marginalizations or, or whatever it is, um, you know, sometimes you, it can get, you sort of have to to think a lot about that, you know, how, how do people perceive me? How people, how have people perceived me in the past? How do I perceive myself? And I think, um, you know, there's there also tends to be from outside sources this uh, this desire to flatten, this sort of desire to say like all mixed race people experience this like X, all Asian people experience this like Y, and you know that's that's just not true. Everyone is their own individual person who experiences things differently. And I I think like for me, I was thinking about this, especially in terms of mixed race people, because I, and and actually also in terms of the the sort of Asian American diaspora, because there, again, there are so many identities within that. Um, If you try to flatten it down to one thing, you know, it doesn't really work. so, you know, I've always said that that my greatest desire is that everybody sort of gets to to write and to be seen in, in all of their complexities and all of their nuances and all of things that 
are then not considered, I guess, you know, negative. Like there, there sort of tends to be like a lot of talk about, you know, stereotypes in fiction, stereotypes in stories and what that means. And I have sort of struggled with this in different ways. And one of those ways was there were certain things that people at different points had kind of earmarked as like, this is a stereotype. Uh, for mm -hmm. instance, one of those was the Asian girl hair streak. Um, so there was this kind of thing a few years ago where someone discovered that um, there were all of these characters, these like, Asian girl characters that people to sort of show like, this isn't your typical, like it's not the stereotype you're thinking of where she's quiet and shy and good at math. She's a rebel, she's yeah. that uh -huh. She has like a blue hair streak and that's how you know. <laughs> And so I was thinking about that because in one of my books, I had a main character who had been a supporting character in a previous mm. book who had blue and purple hair and she's an Asian girl. And when I went to write her book, I was sort of like, do I need to do that? Oh, <laughs> yeah. would be like, it's a stereotype that she has a purple and blue streaks in her hair. And I thought about it and I was like, no, because <laughs> I think ultimately, a stereotype is not the presence of one trait, it is the lack of all others. So if you have a girl who has a hair streak and it's supposed to stand in for literally every quality she has, <laughs> and it's the only way that you know that she's a rebel, then yeah, that's a stereotype. A mm -hmm. But if she is the main character written also by an Asian American author and she has many qualities, many traits, mm -hmm. and she has a hair streak because she likes how it looks. And by the way, there are also lots of Asian women in real life who have blue and purple hair streaks, mm -hmm. then that's just a character. That's just a fully drawn, hopefully if I've done my job, character. And uh, so I actually ended up addressing that one by putting it in text. I had another character who kind of tried to come at her about the hair streak and she shut it down and was like, I'm a real person, which is funny because she's not, she is a fictional character. But <laughs> <laughs> does she think she is? <laughs> something that wasn't true to shut that down. But um, I, I think that, you know, I just really have this, uh, this deep desire for us to be able to see in all of this, those complexities. And so my challenge to myself as a writer always is kind of like, look at this critically and yes, make sure you're not leaning into or falling into something that you have perhaps internalized after a year, an entire lifetime of consuming white constructed media but <laughs> also recognize that, you know, there are some of these things that are actually complexities or nuances that you can bring out in that way if that is what you want to do. Thank you. Yes, Katie. I, yeah, I mean, I really, that really resonates with me. I think like, um, you know, something that I don't know, it's, this is my, that was my first young adult book. So I don't know whether it's fair to generalize from that yet, but it does feel like, you know, part of this is the, the way that things are improving and that we're demanding more of our writers and, and the books that we see in the world, which is great. But then there's also, I don't want it to feel like someone who's an Asian American author like Sarah or a gay author like me. It's like, we have to make our protagonists more perfect than like a white straight main character would be. Um, and, and I don't think, you know, like Sarah's saying, like they should be allowed the complexities of any other teenager who's imperfect and doesn't, know everything and and kind of has their own misconceptions and um and even stereotypes i mean high school is prime time for stereotypes like we're all just trying to fit in and express ourselves all in the ways that everyone has always tried to fit in and express themselves and um you know in quinn's case like i mentioned with ruby she she still falls into that assumption like this girl's straight like you know if if she had a boyfriend she's straight and and i wanted to show like even she can make that mistake but she can also be corrected and learn and grow from it because she is a kid and um you know i think that our our marginalized uh main characters should have that same freedom to mess up and learn and grow absolutely yeah marginalized characters should be allowed to be jerks that's what I yeah <laughs> I have also yeah. really pushed it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's jerks too. Yes. <laughs> jerks, messy, confused, mm -hmm. right? As Katie said, corrected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you no, know, you don't want to put it out there like my main character is a jerk and that's totally okay. Like, totally okay. <laughs> <laughs> some learning and some 
arcing that that's happening, <laughs> but you know, that's all part of making them real. Right. Right. Yeah. And the complexity of, like you said, of making them real reality is a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we give it credit for. Um, we're coming near an end. And I want to, and it's only the end of this panel, everybody. You all <laughs> go get these books. It doesn't end there. It doesn't. It doesn't. These books are available. But before we end, I just want to say, all writers who write coming of age stories are kind of nostalgic. Don't lie. Don't lie. There's a little nostalgia in all of us. <laughs> and I'm just curious what you're nostalgic for. I would have to say it's waiting in line for concert tickets. I know. I'm crazy. I'm a Gen X. <laughs> it was an event. No one gets it. And that was like the pre thing to going to a <laughs> concert. You were going to wait yeah. in line all night long. <laughs> <laughs> And it was a party. I mean, Katie, what are what are you nostalgic for when you, from your coming of age era? Yeah, I mean, I I really think the main thing is um, just spending like vast quantities of time with your best friend, doing not much of anything, um, and pretending you're doing homework, not really getting much done. Um, yeah, and just just sort of maybe the drama of everyday life, like yeah. there's just always something new happening and, and being around a bunch of people your own age, like yeah. that doesn't really continue after college. Um, and so, you know, that that's probably the part I missed the most. But I also think what was nice about this book, for me at least, was that it gave me something I could sort of create nostalgia for that I didn't experience because I wasn't out in high school. It took me many more years than that. And so I was sort of able to create this experience that I wish I had gotten um, and and find some comfort in that too. Thank you. And Sarah, thank you. What about you, Sarah? What are you nostalgic oh, for? Yeah. I'm coming of age, era. Oh, I also <laughs> wish for lots of un un uninterrupted time with my best friends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. oh, that sounds amazing. Um, but I think um, a lot of it for me is like just that sense of wonder, that kind mm -hmm. of sense of possibility. You know, I um, recently, uh, my, my brother is cleaning out like our old family home. So he keeps like sending me stuff. So uh, we keep finding these things that we did when we were, when we were kids or, or tweens or teens. And one of them was like, we used to spend all this time making comics. Like we used to like draw it, right? Like, <laughs> and they were so weird. Like, <laughs> One of them that I've talked about quite a bit was um, apparently at one point in our lives, we were both obsessed with two things, um, Star Trek and um, Lamb Chop, the, you know, the little couple. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know why those two things, but so we combined them into a comic that was basically, it was called uh, Lamb Trek and it was <laughs> Star Trek, but with all lamb chops. And I please release this. <laughs> I was like, okay, first of all, I don't know what we were doing that we came up like that we randomly came up with this, but also it seemed like something that you absolutely would come up with as a kid, right? Like you're yeah. just like there's no one judging me. Like my internal sort of editor hasn't turned on yet. I'm not thinking about like who's the audience for this or how will people respond to this book or will my editor like it or will someone buy it or whatever? Like we aren't thinking about that. So we just have this sense of like possibility, <laughs> like we can make anything and spend a lot of time on it and that's fine. And so I think um, something I've been trying to sort of refine in myself is that sense of wonder where I can just come up with something weird and I'm not immediately judging myself for it. And, you know, I think in Little Tokyo, there's a bit of that with, with Rika. She always feels judged. She judges herself the most harshly of all. And um, she kind of has to find that sense of wonder again that lets her see that you know you can have a fairy tale you can't you know you this very grouchy person who doesn't fit in in your community and doesn't like princess things and doesn't do, believe in happy endings like you can find <laughs> your own fairy tale you can make that for yourself if you just kind of open yourself up to this sense of wonder so that's something I am trying to find <laughs> myself again as well. I, I think this is like, these are the perfect notes to end on. Both of you, Tony Rob, a sense of wonder, hanging out with my best friends. We just came out of a pandemic. We can do this. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? You came out of a pandemic, everybody, but you can still read a book. Okay? So please, please, please thank 
thank, thank, thank you, Sarah Kuhn and Katie Haney, authors of From Little Tokyo with Love and Girl Crashed Easy to <laughs> Okay, don't forget them. I wanna thank um, our booksellers. You can purchase these books uh, from our indie book partners at bookshop.org. And there you go, there's that website. Please consider supporting the San Diego Council on Literacy by visiting literacysandiego.org. You can continue to join us for the full program of author panels, exciting discussions and live entertainment. And we are streaming it entirely online, entirely online. So you can catch up with this, okay? All videos will be available at sdfestivalofbooks.com. Thank you again for tuning in. Again, I want to thank our producer, Jenna. I want to thank Sarah Kuhn and Katie Haney. Again, my name is Melissa Banales. Thank you so much for joining us for the Young Adult Romance Panel. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.